Well, hello. You're listening to Shaun of the South, brought to you by Case Knives, a tradition in my family, and by Folklore Brewing and Meadery, the best beer in Alabama. Also, by Tennessee Peanuts, visit TennesseePeanut.com. What you're about to hear is our Thanksgiving special recorded last year in Birmingham, Alabama, as we've been traveling around the U.S. and the Southeast recording our shows before audiences to bring them here to you today. A special guest, John Reichman and John Miller, the Chosen Road Bluegrass Band. And later on the show, I read letters from soldiers written on Thanksgiving during the Civil War and other American wars. Also, I tell a story about Thanksgiving as a child. Let's have a listen. And everybody's happy, even grumpy old grandpappy, together on a Saturday night. Well, you are listening to Shaun of the South. We are coming to you live from the magic city of Birmingham, Alabama. This episode brought to you by Case Knives, a tradition in my family, and by Folklore Brewing, the best beer. In Alabama with special guests tonight, Chosen Road and John Rice from everybody. Mm-hmm. If you're feeling low, hey listen buddy, I'm your guy. Just hurry and come over, mama made I pull turnovers together on the Saturday night. to be here in the 22nd state right here in Magic City of Birmingham, Alabama celebrating this fine holiday with you. We want to wish all our listeners out there a happy holiday in Radio Land and on the podcast airwaves. This is my favorite holiday because I was raised as a chubby child. (laughs) Chubby children have a preference when it comes to holidays. We do not see holidays the same as everyone else because we are chubby. I was a kid who wore Husky brand pants bought from the Sears store. And these pants ensured that my favorite holiday would be Thanksgiving. Not only because of the family and the friendship, but because of the mass quantities of carbohydrates and saturated fat. I truly do want to wish everybody out there in our listening audience a very happy Thanksgiving. It was on September the 8th, 1565, when Pedro Menendez de Aviles and 800 Spanish settlers founded the city of St. Augustine in Spanish La Florida. As soon as they were ashore, the landing party celebrated a holy mass, a mass of thanksgiving. And more importantly, they did something that would go down in history forever. They drank the first beer on North American soil. (laughs) The meal came from food that was contained in barrels, which included salted beef and hard tack and peas and of course their beer. But now, after this long, treacherous voyage, they would eat like kings. Immediately, Menendez realized that he didn't want to eat alone. And so he laid out a meal 
and he went out and he compelled guests to come in. His first guests were from the native Siloy tribe. He invited them to dinner and he invited them to celebrate mass along with the Spanish. The celebrant of the first mass was America's very first pastor, Father Francisco Lopez de Mendoza Grajales. Try saying that five times fast. <laughs> Father Francisco performed the very first church service conducted by Europeans on North American soil. And like all God-fearing church pastors in America, he generously took up an offering among the natives. <laughs> At which point, he then sentenced the members of the Siloy tribe to volunteer in the church nursery. <laughs> and what exactly the Siloy tribe thought of those awkward liturgical proceedings with that priest walking around swinging his, his incense and singing in Latin, we don't really know. But we do know that the natives were grateful that these people who arrived on their native soil were Catholic and not Southern Baptist, or else they would have never, ever gotten any free beer. <laughs> Historians have often wondered what the meal was that followed when the first Thanksgiving was celebrated in Florida, contrary to the popular myth that the first American Thanksgiving was celebrated at Plymouth Rock. And the first meal was known to contain several things. The first dish was called cocido, cocido de grau, which was made of various meats like pork, chicken, and mutton, and entrails. And it was made into a soup with vegetables like cabbage and turnips and parsnips and potatoes and carrots and one primary ingredient of chickpeas. And this was accompanied by hard tack and these uh, bottles of red wine which had been imported from Spain, the malted beverages stored in barrels, and of course, battery-powered televisions broadcasting the Alabama-Auburn game. In all honesty, the Siloy tribe probably contributed the majority of the meal from their own food stores as kind native people. And the menu probably consisted of turkey, venison, gopher tortoise, mullet, drumfish, sea catfish, beans, squash, collards, and of course, cornbread. There was music, of course, because no gathering is without it. There was lots of traditional music from both, from both cultures. There was eating, there was celebrating, there was laughing. It was the first European religious gathering on North American soil. It took place 300 yards just north of Castillo de San Marcos at what is now the mission of Nombre de Dios in Florida. This event is commemorated by a 250 foot cross which stands at the original landing site and also by lots of wandering Florida tourists in St. Augustine t-shirts, drinking Florida's sacred ceremonial drink, Budweiser. <laughs> it's true, first Thanksgiving was celebrated in Florida. 56 years later, in September of 1620, a small ship called the Mayflower left Plymouth, England, carrying 102 passengers and an assortment of religious separatists and people seeking real estate. They sought a new home where they could freely practice their faith. And after their treacherous and uncomfortable crossing on the Atlantic that lasted 66 days, they dropped anchor near the tip of Cape Cod, far north of their intended destination. One year later, after suffering scurvy, malnutrition, disease, illness, and death, in the November of 1621, after the Pilgrims' first corn harvest, with the help of friendly natives from the, from the surrounding tribes of the Wapanoag tribe, Governor William Bradford organized a celebratory feast and he invited a group of the fledgling colonies, Native American allies, including Chief Masuit of the Wampanoag tribe. This was now remembered as the first official Thanksgiving on American soil, and it made the feast down in Florida look almost tame by comparison 
The pilgrims, who we have now come to see as the predecessors of the teetotaling Puritans, celebrated with alcohol for three days solid. You might think about that the next time you visit your local Southern Baptist Church. <laughs> well, we are proud to be here in Alabama. We're proud to be celebrating this beautiful holiday with you. Let's welcome up here to the stage, everybody, Chosen Road. Here I raise my Ebenezer 
good pleasure safely to our bright land home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious See thy lovely face clothed in the blood washed linen. How I'll sing thy wondrous grace. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Take my ransom soul away. Send thy angels now to care. It might seem as though Thanksgiving is older than the earth itself, older than the Grand Canyon, and older than the oldest tree that grows in the United States. But the truth is, Thanksgiving is a relatively new holiday, a relatively new holiday, at least in the official sense. It comes to us October the 20th, 1864, when President Lincoln established this holiday by printing a, a proclamation in every U.S. newspaper. And the proclamation was printed and read like this. I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States of America, do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and I recommend to them while offering up the ascriptions justly due to God that they do also with humble penitence for our national perverseness and disobedience to commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged and fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it 
as soon as may be consistent with divine purposes to fulfill the enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. This first Thanksgiving letter comes to us from Vidal Tom, originally from Nashua, New Hampshire, from November 26, 1863, when he was stationed in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Dearest brother, I suppose you're having a good time this Thanksgiving, eating plum pudding and chicken pie and cider. At least I hope you are, at any rate. For I want you to enjoy yourself. I should like to be with you. And I know you'd like to have me. But still, although I cannot be with you to enjoy your luxuries and your company, I have many things to be thankful for. I'm thankful foremost that my life has been spared unto me. As many of my friends are dead, and I'm thankful that I still enjoy good health. I'm thus hopeful that our army will be successful, and I can hear the cannons now down by the Rapidan River sounding their reports. I fear we have a bloody day ahead of us, and I'm afraid. I should like a few gallons of that cider you told me about in your last letter. And I would like some of them pickled pig's feet too, if you have time to send them. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Love, your brother. November 28th, 1918, Paris, from a U.S. serviceman. Dearest wife, I miss you more than you will ever know on this Thanksgiving day. But I do have good news. Our Corps commander received a telegram today. He told us we are coming home. The war is apparently over. I am almost too scared to believe it. Our commander read that our division would proceed to the embarkation point and begin sail for America soon. I am coming home, darling. I'm coming home to see you and our little one. Thank God for his mercy unto me. This is a happy Thanksgiving, indeed. From a U.S. serviceman, November the 23rd, 1944, in Holland. Dearest darling, here it is Thanksgiving and we are not together. These damned holidays are the painfulest part of our separation. I am sad, but I hope we'll be together next Thanksgiving. Our men are holed up in a monastery, of all places. Today we gave the priests our food and they fixed our meals and they gave us a real feast. And the student priests took turns serving us. They did everything. We didn't lift a finger. At 4 p.m. dinner was served in a big, beautiful library with a domed ceiling. It was a huge room and it looked like you might guess a monastery should look, with books lining the walls. They decorated it with American flags. There were eight American flags altogether. And the orphans drew crayon drawings of all the GIs and it made a lot of soldiers cry to think of our daughters and our sons back home. I hate this war, darling. Before dinner, the monks all sang for us. They sang the Star Spangled Banner and there was not a dry eye in the house. And then they sang the Dutch National Anthem too which has been prohibited for so long in this country. Oh, everything tasted so good. We had white tablecloths. We had fine china. I wish I could describe how good the food was and all the music, but the words wouldn't do the occasion justice. I'm grateful that these monks, these men of God, out of the greatness and kindness of their hearts, gave us a memory to carry always. They took care of your husband, darling. I wasn't happy without you, but I was filled with beauty and a keen sense of gratitude. Please tell our daughter that I love her and I pray for you both every night. November 24th, 1966, Cambodia, from a fourth grade student. Dear American serviceman, 
My fourth grade class is writing letters to all the soldiers over there for Thanksgiving. I hope you are doing good. I hope you like the things I sent you. I don't know if you like Hershey bars the way I do, so I put some M&Ms and other stuff too. My brother likes M&Ms and he says they are better than anything. I'm thinking about you and we are praying for you in Miss Rygard's class every day because your son is in Vietnam and she's worried about him like I am worried about you. What are you doing for Thanksgiving? Do you have lots of friends? What color is your hair? Do you have a girlfriend or a wife or something like that? I hope you have some food and some good things to do that make your holiday really nice. Please ride back. My name is Mary. God bless you. November 27th, 2013, Afghanistan, from a commanding officer. Dear Brad, thank you so much for the boxes of snacks and toiletries to our soldiers. I made sure your gifts were distributed this Thanksgiving to all the soldiers here to share in your generosity. Your gesture will never be forgotten. It is not every day that a 12-year-old boy takes it upon himself to send gifts to us soldiers. Your gifts have helped us feel closer to home even though we have never met you and are so far away from the people who love us. Before dinner, our Thanksgiving feast, the chaplain said a prayer and we all took turns saying things that we were thankful for. And we all named you among the things that we were most grateful for. May the Lord bless, bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. This last letter comes from November the 24th from Birmingham, Alabama from little old me. Dear U.S. servicemen all over the world, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever you find yourself feeling. I am thinking about you on this holiday. I'm thinking mainly about the sacrifices you make every day, about the commitment that you must have to complete your job. And I'm praying for you and for your families. Above all, I hope you will read this on your holiday or listen to this on a podcast wherever you are. I know that you are loved, not just by one guy, not just by people here in a little theater in Birmingham, Alabama, but by an entire nation. Yes, I know people say thank you for your service a whole lot. Maybe sometimes this phrase loses its meaning, but I actually do want to say thank you for your service. So here it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May you have a happy Thanksgiving. May God bless you and your family. Love, Sean Dietrich. John Reisman on the mandolin. John Miller on the guitar.
round of applause. I can close my eyes at this age and I can see Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving of my childhood, vividly in my mind. The theater of my imagination projects these images on an unseen theater screen and you can feel it, you can touch it, you can taste it, you can smell it. Research says that smell is what memories are tied to and I believe the most fragrant aromatic holiday we have is Thanksgiving. And this is probably why it's lodged in my brain. Now this is interesting to me in as much as I just took an online cognitive test that rates the neurofunctionality of your brain. And this test informed me after I spent 20 minutes answering painstaking questions that I have the brain functionality of a municipal fire hydrant. Apparently, I've lost some, some activity up there. Apparently, I've had one too many Pap's Blue Ribbons. <laughs> but it's true, I really can't remember a whole lot about my, my life. When I really think back, I, I can't even remember what exactly I had for dinner tonight before I came to the show. <laughs> things change as you get older and you forget more things. You, you prioritize your memories is what I believe. You, you have certain memories that require a whole lot of energy to, to hold on to, and you have other memories that, that you just willingly let slip away, such as terrible public speeches like this one. <laughs> They're kind of self-erasing speeches, if you will. But Thanksgiving is vivid in my brain. It is. It's colorful. It is fragrant. It is right there. I can see it, taste it, touch it. I can see myself as a little child, chubby from far too many Little Debbie products, <laughs> walking into my grandmother's single-wide trailer on the lake where she and my granddaddy lived. And I could see her in that kitchen, and she's struggling with that bird that's in one of them, one of them big old pans, those square-shaped pans. And she's got that bird in that thing, and it is being basted with copious amounts of butter, and she's sprinkling spices on it, and she's shoving things up in the crevices of its you-know-what. <laughs> and she's smiling, and in the corner, there's this radio on the windowsill, and it is broadcasting gospel music, always gospel music, like George Beverly Shea or Elvis singing something gospely like he used to do. And my grandmother cranks up the volume, and she sings along. She sings... Just as I am without one plea. And she sings every single word without ever once dropping the cigarette out the corner of her mouth. <laughs> and there were other women in the kitchen with her, young women, beautiful women, slender, with blonde hair and wrinkle-free skin, tall and lean, Nowadays, many of them look like Aunt B. <laughs> but back then, they were confined in the kitchen as young women to do jobs that were not of any consequence to the Thanksgiving meal because by my granny, they were deemed unfit as cooks. <laughs> and so these young women were forced to sit in the corner and watch the queen mother <laughs> do her work while they were tasked with the job, simple job of either mashing a potato or opening a can of cranberry sauce, and that was it. <laughs> the table out in the dining room had all the leaves in it, and it was extended full on. It was extended full on, and we were all about to put nice dishes on the table, because I come from people who don't always use the good dishes, and our glass cabinet we would get to the very back and we would get the nice goblets and place them on the table. And the table was covered in a blue and white checkered gingham cloth. And we would reach past the everyday bowls that we would use. My family always had a, a, a set of salad bowl, bowls that said Cool Whip on the side. 
But on Thanksgiving, we didn't use those bowls. We used the nice bowls. We'd reach into the back of the cabinet. We'd get the bowls, and we'd set them out. We'd get the plates, and we'd set them out. And the table looked so nice and lovely. And then we were, we were charged with the uh, job of lighting the candles. There was always a little candelabra on the table. My cousin Ed Lee loved playing with matches. <laughs> and so when he was in the dining room attempting to see if a stick of butter would light on fire, <laughs> it was my granny who came walking through the dining room with her wooden spoon high in her hand, used as a weapon, and she pop, pop, popped him three times before we even knew what had happened. <laughs> he screamed and we ran out of the dining room into that den where all the men were sitting on that camel brown sofa reclining with one hand in their pants. <laughs> I don't know why men do this, but it seems impossible to sit before a television and watch it without sliding your right hand just underneath your waistline. Just like right here. This is how we watch sports. This is how we watch baseball. You have to have one hand tucked in your pants. The women don't understand it, and it's simple. It's a simple explanation why we put one hand in our pants. Because our other hand is for holding the beer. And we were watching some parade on television, some, some huge float going down some main street in some large city that neither of us had ever been to, like New York or Chicago or L.A. And then we'd watch a football game, a football game, and we would watch with great intensity, with almost severe intensity, because this was our contribution to the holiday. The women were making sure everybody ate and that everybody was fed and, and they had plenty of nutrition. There was a balanced meal on the table with a protein, a carbohydrate, a green vegetable, and something sweet. But we men had one task during this day, and that was to make sure our football team won. <laughs> and so I can see them seated on that sofa with one hand in their pants, and they are willing their team to get the ball across the line by using words that Southern Baptist men do not often use. <laughs> they are making lewd remarks about the referee and his mother. <laughs> and occasionally they are jumping up and down off the sofa onto the floor of that single wide trailer making the chassis go wah, 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 with each crashing impact they make on the floor. Meanwhile, we kids were playing outside, which really made us feel like we were getting away with something because on Thanksgiving, you have to dress up. You dress up on Thanksgiving because this is the way it's done. Back then, we dressed up on the holidays. I'm not sure what they do now. I see kids in my neighborhood wearing different kinds of clothes, t-shirts and jeans and no, 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 no. During my day, we dressed up like we were going to somebody's funeral. Our mother would place us in brand new khaki pants that were pressed sharp enough to slice tomatoes. We had a tucked in white pressed starched shirt with a collar that dug into your neck and drew blood. <laughs> we wore our brand new shoes that we only wore at memorial services and weddings. These were shoes that had been purchased from Kmart and worn very few times in our life so that the leather was so stiff they dug into your Achilles heel and permanently injured you. And our hair was fixed nice, stuck to our head with nothing but mama's own spit. <laughs> and so you really felt like you were getting away with murder when you were outside in the yard playing around in your nice clothes. But we did. We did it every single Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was the greatest play day of the year. We all got outside and we played games that were in intended to break each other's arms, such as Red Rover. We played the cruelest game there ever was, which is tag. 
wherein you make one child who is very chubby and slow on his feet the person who is it. I have been it since 1982. <laughs> and I'm still it today. We would play hide and seek. We would play, we would play baseball, we'd play football. We'd play kickball, dodgeball. And by the time we got inside and it was time to eat, our clothes were so covered in dirt and green grass stains that our mothers grounded us until we were 47 years old. <laughs> we would go into the bathroom and our mothers would use these coarse rags that were very abrasive and she'd lick them and spit on them and she'd dip them in the sink with lava brand soap that would, could draw blood on a baby's skin. And she'd scrub us with that rag. She'd scrub us just raw. And she'd say, I can't believe you were playing in your nice clothes. I can't believe you were out there playing in your fancy Sunday clothes. And then it was time to say grace. Now grace at Thanksgiving is, is a elaborate affair. It is not the same kind of grace that you say during any other meal. Some of the popular graces you might say, some of the blessings you'd use at an informal gathering would be, bless us, O Lord, in these side gifts, which you're about to receive, amen. Or you could say, come Lord Jesus, be our guest. May this food be truly blessed. Or you just give it the old one, two, under the teeth, through the gums, look out, stomach, here it comes. <laughs> but not on Thanksgiving. On Thanksgiving, the patriarch male of your family stands up and he is compelled to deliver a prayer that sounds like it was written by Shakespeare. <laughs> this prayer must endure at least four minutes and 30 seconds, but longer if you are indeed a real Southern Baptist. <laughs> so I can remember my granddaddy, in this case, standing up. He had his nice trousers on his Sansa belt pants, <laughs> and his short-sleeved button-down shirt was tucked in and tied at the waist with a belt with his pretty prairie rodeo belt buckle. He had horn-rimmed glasses and a bald head that shined like a cue ball beneath the fluorescent lights of the trailer. <laughs> and as he opened his mouth to recite, we all held hands and we all bowed our heads and exercised total reverence. And he said, Dear Lord, oh Lord, make us truly grateful for the bountiful gifts which are prepared before us and seated on this table of bounty. Dear Lord, we thank thee that you are present, you are our guest today, and we hope that we can be truly worthy of your service. And as he prayed, I looked at my cousin Ed Lee who had a long string of saliva that was coming down <laughs> his chin from the corner of his mouth and it was reached all the way to his belly button. <laughs> and granddaddy was just getting warmed up when he said, Yea, Lord, do we beseech thee to always be nigh unto your children in times of trouble and heartache and severity with caution and love and graciousness and the bounty of your mercy. And I looked across the table and I saw my other cousin, my cousin Marie. Her eyes were focused on that huge mound of mashed potatoes in which she had just shoved a naked Barbie doll. <laughs> the naked Barbie was wading through a waist-high pile of mashed potatoes. And it looked like someone had previously set her charred head on fire. And granddaddy prayed like this until the older people among us started to have the knee shakes from low blood sugar. And at least one in our family had passed out from a diabetic coma. <laughs> and then it was time to eat. Oh, the food at these gatherings was legendary. There were many dishes that were only cooked this time of year. One of those dishes was something that is known as funeral potatoes. Now funeral potatoes is a dish that lots of people get at their funerals, but only if you die. <laughs> Otherwise, you never get to eat it 
unless it's Thanksgiving. Funeral potatoes are tiny cube potatoes diced up and sauteed in butter and placed into a square casserole dish topped with at least five blocks of hard cheddar cheese and then garnished with cornflakes. There were all kinds of vegetables that all looked and tasted the same because all they were were just green mush <laughs> because we believe in overcooked vegetables. And then when it came time to eat the sweet potato pie, there were three or four different sweet potato pies, and the women who had cooked these pies were looking at you as you walked through the food line, making sure that you got one of their pies. This is why people in my family, if they don't have diabetes by age 12, are they even trying? <laughs> we would get big old scoops of mashed potatoes the size of regulation softballs, and place them on our plate, and would use the, the ladle to dig a little cavern in the mashed potatoes, and then we would s slowly turn that ladle ever so slightly to get that turkey gravy to fill that cavern, and you had right there on your plate, Crater Lake. <laughs> and granddaddy would be carving the turkey because it's a great honor for the male of the family to carve the turkey, and he acts like this is a really, really hard job. He acts like this is something you have to go to school and get a nuclear science degree to learn. And as he's carving that turkey, one slice falls off and you can just see it's cooked to perfection. It's moist, it's beautiful. And he places it on your plate, he says, white or dark? And you say both. And he gives you a slice of both. And as you're sitting there eating this wonderful food, you can't help but notice your cousin Ed Lee is shoving mashed potatoes into his mouth more than any human could swallow until his cheeks have puffed up to at least three times their normal size. And you smile and you begin to laugh because you know that Cousin Ed Lee is about to perform his impersonation of a human zit. <laughs> and when it's all said and done, you go into the kitchen again and it's time to eat dessert. There are pies of every kind. There are pumpkin pies, pecan pies, lemon icebox pies, chess pies, blackberry cobbler, strawberry pie, peach cobbler, peach bread pudding. There is, there is fruit cake that is doused in a rum sauce. And there is Coca-Cola pie. There's chocolate pie. There's homemade fudge. There are 10 different kinds of pound cakes, including 7-Up pound cake, chocolate pound cake, cinnamon swirl pound cake, lemon pound cake. When you finally finish your journey through the art of refined sugar, <laughs> as a little boy, you will take your plates into the kitchen and you will ask to help you the dishes only you will not be allowed because your granny is having an argument with the young women in your family who have tried to help her throughout this entire time, but granny has consistently been the martyr and said, no, 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 I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. And your mother looks at you and says, get out of this kitchen right now. <laughs> and so you have the rest of the day to digest your food. You walk out of that kitchen as a young man and you stagger to the living room where the men are now watching a football game on television. And you're bloated and you're in pain and your pancreas is working triple time. And as you're walking toward that room, you and your cousin, you plop onto the sofa and the waist of your pants is cutting into you so hard that there's nothing else you can do to relieve yourself but to get your right hand and shove it in the waistline of your pants. <laughs> and this is the moment in your life when you have truly become a male. <laughs> this is the moment in your life when you've joined the family. <laughs> yes, I can see it all. I can see that Thanksgiving in my mind's eye. I can smell the aromas. I can see the yellow funk that's gathered on the walls from too many cigarettes smoked by granny and granddaddy on the walls of that trailer. I can see the bun coffee machine that's perched on the counter looking like a silver bullet which has been pumping coffee ever since the Hoover administration. And I can touch it with my hands if I try hard enough. Our memories really aren't that far away. No, not far away at all. Hey, thanks for having me this night. It's been a good pleasure. Well, 
Well, that's our show for you here tonight. That's our show coming to you live from Birmingham, Alabama. Our special guests tonight, Chosen Road and John Weissman, everybody. This episode brought to you by Case Knives, a tradition in my family, and by Folklore Brewing and Meadery, the best beer in Alabama. Special thanks to Kim Scotts, John Rady, Silvio Centamore, Aaron Peters, Alan Wright, and Federico Haccini. There was a little boy and his hair was flaming red. He always ate his taters and he'd wander up the bed. He tuned up his fiddle and he'd rouse up his bow. And he played that fiddle till the cows came home. Please come home for your mama misses you and it's cold alone. Red haired boy, won't you please come home and play your fiddle till the cows come home? Happy Thanksgiving, everybody!